thank you, Paul, for the introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about something slightly different from what uh, my colleagues yesterday spoke about. It's related but slightly different in the sense of uh, all the speakers yesterday were focusing on the upstream sector, the oil and, oil and gas, but I'm going to focus on the downstream, midstream and downstream sector of the European oil and gas. This is my presentation outline. I will, I will give you some introduction of, of the basic concepts, the global overview of the midstream and the downstream sector, the overview of the Namibian downstream sector, I will offer some perspective on the, how the old discovery could potentially change the downstream sector of the Namibian industry, and then uh, some opportunities in the downstream sector of the Namibian industry. The petroleum uh, sector industry is made up of, 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 of three segments. The upstream sector, which uh, comprises of exploration and production. The midstream. After exploration and production, now the oil is the, is at the production platform. So the oil now needs to be taken either to customers or the storage facilities. That's where the midstream sector starts. Meaning the midstream sector starts the storage and transportation of, uh, of crude oil or refined product. And then after the transportation or storage, the downstream sector kicks in, which involves uh, oil refining, supply and trading, product marketing and wholesale, which we are basically doing in our region. But what is crude oil? I think my, my colleague last night uh, touched in detail on this topic. Uh, this is what uh, looks like. That's why they call it the best stuff. So, which is just a mixture of iron hydrocarbons that form from the remains and animals, plants, and other organisms that lived on Earth millions years ago. So, the heat and pressure from these layers turn the remains into what now. What are the characteristics of the mid and downstream sector? The first characteristic is that it's a mining business. Whether you are an oil producer, whether you are a trader, whether you own a refinery or maybe a storage facility, all you are, you are, you are, you are getting from the business is your margin. If you are a producer, obviously your, 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 your margin would be the prevailing crude oil price minus your cost of production. That's why you find some countries with massive oil reserves, but they don't really produce because their cost of production is high. If you are a trader, obviously, meaning you buy and sell, your margin would be the prevailing oil price minus your cost, the price at which you bought the, the, the oil. You are shipping it, freight. You have to insure it and you have, you have to account for ocean losses in the sea and then the time value for money, of course. You might have borrowed some money from the bank to buy this product, so you have to account for that. And then you, if you own a refinery, this is the, your margin, uh, the prevailing price at the time when you bought the product. You add uh, the freight, the ocean losses and insurance, and then your refining cost plus the time value for money. The second characteristic is that it's very complex. What are the key activities? It includes all, pro all, all transportation, all storage. There are, people, there are businesses that solely just focus on all transportation. Some only build storage facilities. Some only build refineries. Some are only focused on supply and trading. And some are marketing petroleum products like lubricants. And some are doing wholesale and, and, and retail. And the third one, uh, it requires a global perspective in the sense that the prices are not determined by you, any, anybody, determined by the market. So yeah. the dynamics of supply and demand ultimately determines your price and you have to, to, to address yourself with it so that you, you know when to 
to sell or to buy. And then the last one is the uh, end user consumption based. All these activities, whatever you do, the aim, the end goal is to get the product to the end consumer. Nobody uh, drives a car that uh, runs on crude oil. We all want fuel at the end of the day. So whatever you do with your refining, you're transporting, you're storing it, you all just want to take this product to the consumer and that's where it should, it, should, it should get to. Who are the major players in this industry? We have the, the first, the major oil companies. These are the companies that started this industry. If uh, there is a documentary on Al Jazeera about the secret of the Seven Sisters, the, the oil companies that started uh, this industry, uh, I think the, 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 the founder of Shell is actually was called the Napoleon of oil. And then we have the Exxon Mobil. I'm sure maybe some of you have heard of the Rosafera. This was their, they, that's, it used to be called uh, Standard Oil. Exxon and Mobil were two companies and they were combined. Uh, there was also Gulf and Exxon It was uh, combined into Chevron and then this uh, British Petroleum. Then you have the national oil companies. Obviously, the first one is the Saudi Aramco. Uh, somebody the other day said they are companies in the Saudi Aramco. <laughs> because uh, that was the time when I think it ran into a trillion or two trillion market capitalization. And then you have uh, Pemex, this company is from uh, Mexico, it's on Angola, it's Angola, and then like, Nigerian Petroleum. And uh, you have uh, Adnok, this is Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. They also participate in the upstream, downstream, uh, midstream, and downstream. And then you have this large integrated in the, in the sense that they are focused on all the sectors. Uh, total energies was total. And then they are now expanding into renewable, that's why they are expanding their name to total energies. If we know as Statoy, this is uh, from Norway. They are focused also on, 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 on all kinds of energy sources. And then Repsol uh, from Spain and any is from Italy. And then you have all refiners. This company only <coughs> build refineries. They are not interested in selling a pipe. They just want to build refineries. If you have crude oil, you take it to them. They refine it for you. You pay their margin and then you take your product to wherever you want. And these are the, the Valero, Reliance. And then you have the the old traders. Uh, we have Trafigura. Trafigura owns Puma Energy. The Puma we have in Namibia and Vito. Vito owns uh, Shell and Vivo. Yeah, Vivo. Vivo. And then Ganbo and then Telco. These ones are only focused on the trade, on, on the downstream sector. They're not participating in the upstream. And these are the common, I mean, they are common all benchmarks. You know when oil is priced, you know, it's based on, on benchmarks, depending on your crude types. So these crude types determines your price and the appetite for, 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 for market participants to buy crude. Well, Angola is heavy sweet. You can, Russia, you can see here, Russia is uh, Euros, and uh, Saudi Arabia is Arabian light. And we have this, uh, this is a very important uh, benchmark in terms of pricing. I remember during COVID, it was the first to, to crash and the whole market crashed at you. It's, it's, it's Western Texas intermediate and very cool. These two are very important. And then you have the Malaysia and Turkey. Uh, the report we are getting is that we are most likely to discover light sweet. So the reason why it matters is because for some, for when you have a refinery, you want uh, crude oil that is easy to refine. You can say, see here in Venezuela is heavy, it's very sour, a very heavy sour. This this crude oil is very very hard to refine. So if you are comparing it to light sweet, uh, somebody with with a refinery would most likely take light sweet as opposed to very sour crude oil. And then these are the, the largest refineries in the world. We have uh, the first one here, uh, India, by Reliance, 
Uh, they are producing 1.2 million barrels per day. And uh, in Africa, we only have Dangote Group here. They were it's coming on board. It only came on board this year, producing 650,000 barrels per day. And then, uh, surprisingly, China, who is the second consumer of oil, they are trading back here in tea, meaning they are getting oil from everywhere they can find. They don't have, really have refineries at home. And what are the derivatives of crude oil? Nobody has a car that is running on crude oil here, because it's not just the raw material. From crude oil, you, we need gasoline, which is petrol. Diesel, some um, call it gas oil, uh, jet fuel, and fuel, fuel oil for ships. We call this now very low sulfur fuel oil, and, and then uh, kerosene, and naphtha for your petrochemicals, for your paint and pesticides. And then we have gas. I'm sure a lot of us have uh, gas stoves, so this is the, uh, the, the gas. It's not the natural gas. It's the liquefied petroleum gas. Global oil pricing. Who price oil? When you see those prices on your map <coughs> or on your screen, it's the <laughs> global, not Indian <coughs> oil. <laughs> we have a company started uh, it was it was started by a journalist. These journalists were just interested in reporting about prior about oil prices. And it turned into a global company. It's called uh, SP Global Plants. And now I think it's renamed to Global Commodity Insights. They remove the plants. And they, they do assessments on a daily basis with like 60% of crude in the world. Uh, and I think it, it came down to 60 because Saudi Arabia protested against them and they moved to their competitor, August, August Media Group, which was started in the 1970s. So these guys, they do assessments every day. When traders are doing deals, they, they, they report on those deals, and they report the product, the daily high and the low. And they call that the mean of plots. So when they are drafting their contracts, they are always referring to mean of plots. It means it's mean of what they have assessed per day for that day. And the units they use is either US dollar per barrel, US dollar per metric ton, especially in Europe. And for the US market, it's US cents per gallon. And the trade are guided by international commercial terms. I think it's not only the oil industry, all other industries also use import terms that are reviewed every 10 years by the International Chamber of Commerce. And these are the input terms. Whatever you do, whether you want to get product, it's either you, 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 or you, you, you trade in XOX or but for Namibia, we are using delivery place. Uh, these terms define the risk. At what point does the seller assume the risk and the buyer assume the risk? So for Namibia, we only assume the risk when the product is delivered at in our terms. When it's in mortgage bill, that's when we assume the risk. Until it, it, it lands there, it's not our responsibility, it's the seller's responsibility. But you can choose any other. If you, you can charter a vessel yourself, you can buy it. FOB, then you insure your own product and cater for all those losses and insurance. Then the global oil demand and supply. This is what determines our local oil pump price. Whenever you hear the prices are increasing, it's not really mindset. We are, we, are, we are price takers. Whatever the market gives us, we just, we just implement. So you can see here from 20, 2010, demand was 87, global demand, what we consume, the whole world, it was 87 million barrels per day against the supply of 87. Also, the, 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 the demand and supply was, was close. And in 2020, there was COVID here where nobody was interested in oil, they were just interested in their health. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see here demand, demand was very low. It was actually 58 million 
barrels per day against 90 millions of supply. So nobody wanted to drive you. Oh, we were not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we had no choice. So what drives demand? Mostly whether you travel by road or by ship or by air or on travel by train, you you have you are very important. So that's what drives the, the demand and petrochemicals also usage. And what drives supply? Mostly it's open plus. It was just open. This is an organization of petroleum exporting countries. Plus they added 10 members. And this organization was actually not started really because they wanted to start it. It was in protest. Remember the seven sisters I showed you who started the oil industry. So those sisters, what they in 1960 they reduced the price of uh, the Venezuelan oil and some Arab countries. That's when they this uh, uh, members decided. We, we are going to start our own organization. We are not going to be dictated, our terms are not going to be dictated by the seven sisters who are controlling close to 85% of, 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 of the global market. Global production here. And here I will, I will emphasize that production doesn't necessarily mean supply. Because you can produce, but you are not necessarily going to supply anyway. Uh, OPEC is controlling the global supply. But the United States is controlling the global production. Here you can see the top five uh, of members of OPEC and the top five non-OPEC members. The US is producing 21 million barrels per day. But uh, Saudi Arabia is producing 9.9 million barrels per day. But Saudi Arabia is controlling supply. Why? Because the US consumes their own oil. They consume, uh, consume around 20 million barrels per day. And they are producing 21. Saudi Arabia is probably just using 500,000 from the 9 million. So the rest of it, they send to us and the rest, the rest of the world. That's why they are controlling supply, but the U.S. is, control, is controlling production. And the object, what was the objective of forming uh, OPEC? Uh, it was to coordinate and unify petroleum policies among member states to secure fair and stable prices. That's why whenever prices are going down, OPEC members always have a meeting. So they discuss that how much money do we need in our countries for our budget? Let's cut production and the prices will shoot up. And that's what we have uh, this month. <laughs> Saudi Arabia decided they are cutting 1 million, 2 million barrels from the market. And suddenly we have $1.70 uh, cents per meter. We're actually financing some of the projects in these countries, among all the members. And, uh, like I said, the US is the biggest oil producer, but they don't, they don't supply anybody because they need, they are very thirsty for their own oil, or maybe the economy is too big. And they can get some of the oil, especially from Russia. So. And we come to the international oil trading. You can see this guy is probably a trader. You can see the red numbers there. It's a bad day in the market. Whenever you see red, red numbers in the market, it's an extremely bad day, and he has probably made some mistakes. That's why he looks like that. What, what does it mean to, to, to trade oil? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a simple, actually, business principle. You buy and sell. But the trick is here. You buy at the price you don't determine, and you are going to sell at the, pre, at the price that you don't determine. So now what you need to control is when do I sell and when do I buy? You buy low now and you sell later, but what if the price actually is not in your favor? You can sell high now and buy lower later maybe. Whatever decision you make really is determined by the market and that's why when I say you need a global, global perspective, it means you need to abrist yourself with the market every day if you are in this business. When should you buy or sell? When prices are going up, 
you can you can buy because you are hoping it, uh, it hasn't reached its peak. So you buy when it's here and you go sell when it's here. And when it's for prices are falling, you, you can you can sell when it's here so that it doesn't get here and you lose more. Because you are we don't know where you're gonna how far it can go. So let go of this product immediately so that you don't lose more. And you you in a way hedge you your, yourself. So long position here means you're buying because you are holding to it and you're hoping you're gonna sell it at a high price, and short position means you are letting go, it's a hot potato. And this is the overview of the Namibia downstream sector. In Namibia, we don't really trade per se because the Namibian market is very is, is, is regulated. So we, we we buy and sell, which is trading, we store, we distribute, wholesale and retail marketing for refined petroleum products. And our downstream sector is actually a 20 billion a year revenue in this, 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 this industry is very old. I think it's old as old as the first car. When was the first car in Nigeria? Maybe somebody knows. I'm sure they were getting fuels from somewhere. So it's, it's very old. And uh, Namibia has not proved all of reserves or refinery. All our products, uh, refined products, are come, come from the Middle East, Europe, and, and Singapore, especially uh, Middle East. We get uh, diesel. Europe is mostly petrol in Singapore. All market participants are licensed. For you to participate in this market, you need your license from Mines and Energy. The market is oligopolistic. Oligopolistic means there are few players in the market who don't need, and they probably know each other and they talk every day. And I can assure you they probably do. This is a legislative framework of the Namibia downstream sector. It's regulated by Mines and Energy, the Minister of Mines and Energy. These are the legislation and energy policy of 2017. We have the Petroleum Products and Energy Act of 1990 and the Petroleum uh, Products and Regulation of 2000. And these are the licenses where, which you need to participate in this market. You can just decide that I'm, I'm going to start a, 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 a new company. You need a wholesale license. This allows you to import, export, store fuel, distribute, and resell in bulk. And the retail license, this is for a service station. Only, and it's site specific. You can move this license from NAS to UNAM. You, you need another license for, for UNAM. And the consumer installation certificate is for your own use if in a mine or in a farm or a construction site. You, you need this consumer inst uh, installation certificate because if something happens and you spill, you need to hold you accountable in terms of our environment. And these are the gazetted specifications. We have unleaded petrol 95, automotive diesel diesel oil, which is 50 ppm and 10 ppm. This is ultra low sulfur diesel 10 ppm. And no Mungula is allowed. I'm not sure whether Mungula. <laughs> Mungula is actually, I think it's a strong way of fuel tourism where people are going into Angola because the prices are low and they come with containers and sell wherever without licenses. And it has actually created a, a, a big problem in our Wena region. Who is from our Wena region? <laughs> <laughs> if, if you are from there and you are thinking of opening up a service station in that region, you are in trouble. Because Mungula guys are going to sell next to your farm in a container. <laughs> and this guy was probably going to sell just next to this service station. <laughs> and there's this question that I uh, often get why don't we import fuel from Angola? Angola diesel, which uh, the Mungula guys uh, are getting from the service station near the border is 1,500 ppm. And like I told you, we only, our specification is 10 and, and then 50 and 10 ppm. And the Angolan uh, petrol is 91. 
and we only have 95. With, 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 with diesel, the lower the sulfur content, the better the diesel. And uh, with, with petrol, the higher the octane, the better the petrol. And you can see that our octane level in our, in our, in our petrol is higher than the, the, the angle level. And in line with our Sunday convention on, on cleaner fuel, uh, we all the Sunday countries are supposed to face out their sulfur diesel uh, by 2027. Angola is very behind. You can see they are still at 1,550, so they are still in Benduk and behind. The <laughs> and this is our national consumption. How much fuel do you consume? I told you the whole world consumes around 101 million barrels per day, but we only consume 1.1 billion meters a year. This is a year per year, not month per day. And uh, diesel, you can see here the statistics. Diesel is consumed more than petrol. And uh, the, the, these numbers are important because now, if you have to build a case for a refiner, <coughs> it's a question I get, why don't you build a refinery? Why don't you, so that we can, we can produce our own, refine our own crude oil? 1.1 billion translates to 6 million barrels a day. And 6 million barrels, per, this is per year. If you, you divide 6 million with 158 liters, you get 17,000 barrels per day. 17,000 barrels, this is a modular refinery. Uh, I don't know of any refinery that is 17,000 per day. I think there is one in in Zambia, but it's 24,000, but it was built in the 1960 when the cost was very low and maybe it was for, for the government. So if maybe we have to consider a finally, we have to consider also whether we can supply our neighbor in Botswana or Zambia. But I told you Zambia is a small refinery. Botswana is getting fuel from South Africa. South Africa has six refineries. And Angola has one also for, I think, 39,000 barrels per day. So the case now you make is that should everybody should go to the refinery, or should we just have one country that's a supplier? It's, 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 uh, it's like, uh, in, in South Africa, most of them are not actually working. The, most of the imports and the imported fuel in South Africa is, is, is is coming from the same place we are getting ours from. So if we have to consider a we have to see if we it makes sense for us to, in terms of is it economically viable? Can Botswana sign a contract to say we are no more going to get fuel from South Africa, only you? So but this can only be facility. If it's a private sector that is investing in this, so you have to do the numbers and see if it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, then we probably just have to wait for the Angolan one, which is, I think, 200,000 barrels per day we can get from them instead of investing in our own. And these are the major players in the Namibian downstream market. We have Vivo Energy here, which is owned by Vito. Remember the traders I showed you? And we have Indian. It was bought, Indian South Africa was bought by Petro Nas from Malaysia. And we have Puma, it's owned by Tafidura. Total Energy is owned by the International Total Energy. And, yeah, French. Yeah, and we have Namco. So you can see, it's only among the majors, it's only Namco who is playing here. Yeah. The major, the, major, the major role in this sector. There is. <laughs> you, can, you can see about the market share. I mean, they, all, all of them. But which kind of sales stations do you know? Apart from this. But for us to determine, because we are talking of the local market, some are obviously exporting and all these things. But you can see Namibians, we don't really own this industry. And this is just a picture of where we get our fuel. You can see here, this is the Arab Cow. We call this market the Arab Cow, where we get most of our fuel. 
Kuni of Oman, Bahrain, and United Arab Emirates. And this is where Singapore is. We also get our petrol, and then here we have uh, Europe, where we also get our petrol. And this is the price regulation of uh, in Namibia, like I said. This is not all trading anymore. Here the price is determined by the Ministry of Finance and Energy. You, you, they, they, they deemed cost. They tell you this is the cost to which you should import the product. If you go above that, then you take your own losses. And they are using a model called basic show, more basic show price model. This model is used uh, in South Africa, Botswana, all the sub countries are using the same. And it's just a cost recovery model that is, uh, takes into account all the cost elements which you are going to incur in the value chain. Which uh, like here, it's a FOB, which is the cost of the product, the freight, you are going to ship it, you have to insure it, you might lose some volumes from the, the international market. And then this is the price of citizenship. It's quite high these days, a few days to deliver a product. Uh, and the more the days you have it, the, the, the vessel, the more you trade. And the carbon juice, which is just landing, landing in wafage uh, for now. This, uh, on this, among this, I mean, on these cost elements, if you add the domestic levies and taxes, you get the whole weekly price. And then, if you want to get a price for Achima, you add the value to Crotfontein because you have to transport this product to, to Crotfontein, and there is no value to Achima. So, you have to put it in the tax. And the road. Transport on fuel is, uh, is very expensive because now the rail you can have uh, a lot of fuel takers at once, and for, for, for the trucks you probably need 20 of those, and it becomes expensive. That's why prices in some, 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 some parts of the country are very expensive. How do these participants make money in this industry? Uh, the, by law, you cannot go. You will not uh, uh, operate a, 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 a you can not have a wholesale license and a retail license. It's called vertical integration, meaning if you are importing, you can sell yourself what you imported. You need somebody to sell it to. So you are only given a license to import, to distribute, but you cannot own a service station. And there's a, I think, a question where people say, no, but that war is having service stations and all this. But Puma and Totao and everyone else have service stations, but the question is not being asked. But the, the short answer is that we build it. It's like you're allowed to build a house, but you can only live in it by law. You can only rent it to somebody who has a license to live there. So that's why when you see these service stations, none of the whole companies are, are running those service stations. When they build the service station, you go to my and say, I know how to run a service station. I can have an agreement with a no company. And you get into an agreement, a supply agreement. How do these companies benefit? Obviously, you have to, they will supply you with fuel. And you have to pay them rent and franchise fees for their branding. So that's all they get from the service station. You can also sell to commercial business. Uh, in the export market. Uh, recently, it's been uh, uh, for our neighbor in Zambia and Botswana. You know, uh, Beira is closer to Zambia compared to, to, to Namibia. But Zambians prefer to get products from Namibia instead of getting it from Beira because you can spend 10, 15, 10 to 15 days in the port of Beira compared to driving a truck to Namibia lift in one day and then you go back. So you spend five days, but you save at least 15 days in Bela, which is near. That's why our, 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 our we, Namibia is a preferred uh, destination for their fuel on, on by trucks, but they have a, 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 they are close, they, we are a bit far from them. <coughs> and the major import requirement for you to import fuel Anybody can get the cargo from anywhere, 
But you need where are you going to store the product? So we have a storage uh, a storage problem in Arabia. We don't have enough storage. Even with additional storage that we recently built, it's not still not enough because uh, there are people that are willing to to, to import massive volumes, but they have no storage where or where to, 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 to store the fuel. So if you have some capital, you can put up some storage so that uh, you don't need to be involved in the business. You just need to be charging storage fees everybody who is importing. And how do retailers make money? What determines your profitability is your location, because that determines that maybe the, 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 the traffic flow. So if you, you can just put up a service station in your in a village where there are five cars, obviously the cost of investment is very high and it won't, won't be economically viable for you to recover that, 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 that investment. And the price is regulated, so there's no price competition when it comes to service stations. Prices are the same per ton. So what determines uh, your, your success is, is your customer service. If you go to a service station twice and there's no fuel, you're probably not going to go there. You find an alternative, and that's why most of the service stations don't like running dry. So it boils down to customer service. So how will the all discover in our chain in having an upstream sale? Obviously, uh, after after um, the first years of production, it will be based on production well to. So you, you take it out from the production load, you put it on the batch, and you ship it for refining into the international market because we currently do not have facilities for for, 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 for storage on shore. And then maybe after some years, government can generate revenue from royalty in Texas. And uh, one of the benefits is that we can actually subsidize our own fuel. We can use the Angolan Angolan model. Uh, when people ask why is the Angolan fuel cheaper, it's not because Angola is refining their own fuel or because they, 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 they are producing their own, enough fuel for themselves. They are importing from the same market we are importing, but a different specification. But ultimately, <coughs> they make money from crude oil. You sell crude oil, you generate a lot of money. So whoever is importing now, we find product into the country, you say, if you are lending your fuel at, let's say, $10, the government says, no, you are not going to charge the consumers $10. You can only charge five, and we give you the, 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 the other five. That's how, that's how the Angolan fuel becomes cheaper. By the moment they, they move that subsidy, we will probably not be, uh, we won't have Gumbola in Mashkan. So, if, but in the medium to long term, you can consider an offshore pipeline. The pipeline will bring the product into the storage, and then uh, also a refiner. Like I said, there we are only producing or uh, consuming 1.1 billion per year. If it makes economic sense, you can build a refinery. But all these facilities to put up a pipeline uh, from how, how far is our old discovery? 270. 270 kilometers offshore. So we put up a pipeline that is 270, that's a distance from million beyond the channel. Offshore in the sea, it requires massive investment. So, like I said, our local volumes are relatively small to justify a refinery. Now we can consider supplying. Uh, the countries. And if we build a refinery, it will obviously eliminate all those costs of uh, freight and insurance and everything else, and our, our, our local power prices will come down. And these are the business opportunities in the, in the, in the industry. If you want to get into the downstream sector, like I showed you there, Namco is the only local company that is participating at the high level. <laughs> there are job opportunities, of course. Uh, you, all these companies, uh, Puma, the, the Total, are employing people. 
there is an opportunity, there are opportunities for distribution. So the 1.5, 1.1 billion liters that I, 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 I showed you, most of that product actually moves via road because we don't have uh, a rail everywhere. Like I told you, there's only, if you want to take, take product from Katima, you need trucks from Old Fontaine, which is the last uh, railhead to, to Katima. And most of these products is, uh, is, uh, are transported by trucks, so you can buy trucks. And most of our products are, uh, are by the way, transported by foreign companies. I'm not going to mention the names. And uh, you can apply for a retail license, and then you open up a service station. And I understand the Minister of Personal Energy are doing a post moratorium on retail licenses, but to be lifted. And the fuel storage facilities shortage, which I alluded to earlier, you can build one and then you want to charge a, a storage fees as opposed to being actively importing and, and, and doing all the other activities. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Petrus Nuyoma. Uh, very insightful journey into the mid and downstream sector. Yesterday we unpacked the upstream sector. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd now like to introduce our second speaker, who's also 